It is what? It is nothing. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, boy. We are starting to get uh, sniffles in this household. And we are getting, hopefully, not too sick. But uh, let's see how far it goes. Yeah. It's very interesting, the uh, topic of uh, breakfast this morning is uh, not the gospel commentary yet because uh, well, even prior to that we were talking about sin and punishment for sin and, and deprivation and all of that. Very interesting things to talk about on a Friday morning. By the way, a day of abstinence for uh, those who are 14 and above. A day of abstinence, just as a reminder. Okay, today we're going to read a gospel uh, that is not very easy to understand. Okay, it's one of the it's one of the uh, uh, gospels that are a little complicated to understand uh, because it has some uh, references to the Old Testament and uh, it has some uh, references to something that is uh, um, uh, uh, patently. Uh, um, Jewish in its uh, in its nuisance, but uh, we will try to understand it. Okay, so uh, um, it comes from Matthew chapter nine, verses fourteen to fifteen. So it's very short. The disciples of John approached Jesus and said, "Why do we and the Pharisees fast?" Who's the John here? John the Baptist, okay? John the Baptist. So his apostles, his disciples went to Jesus and asked him, asked Jesus, why do we, the disciples of John and the Pharisees, fast much? Fast much. But your disciples do not fast. Interesting. I am not sure that's an accurate uh, accusation. Right? But uh, anyway, uh, that's what they that's what they say of uh, the disciples of Jesus. Then Jesus answered them, and this is where this very profound answer uh, is worthy of a uh, good explanation. Jesus answered them, "Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them?" The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Okay, bridegroom. What is the bridegroom? It's an image that Jesus uses to describe himself, right? Because he is he is making a claim here that he is the bridegroom. In the midst of his disciples, in the middle of his disciples, that his disciples are with the bridegroom. Now, let's talk about the bridegroom. Who is a bridegroom? The guy who's getting married to a girl. The guy who's getting married to a girl, the bride, right? Yeah. Okay, so he is the yeah. husband to be, or the husband, right? In a wedding, in, in a marriage, okay? Why does Jesus used that image because that has that has a long history in in the uh, in the Old Testament. Many prophets okay, had spoken about the bridegroom, had spoken about marriage, okay? from Isaiah to uh, the prophet Joel to uh, all of the other prophets, Ezekiel, uh, they all spoke about the image of a bridegroom and marriage and weddings. Okay? Because they wanted to help us, the Jewish people and us, understand the kind of love that God has for His people. Okay? And the, the closest image uh, you could get to a, a real intimate relationship that is a consequence of an intimate love is marriage. Okay, So that's the image that, uh, that uh, all the prophets have uh, used to describe the love that God has for His people, His children, 
Okay? It is like the love of man and wife who get married. Okay? It is not just a, 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 a uh, love of friendship or whatever kind of relationship. It is. No, no, no. It is intimate. Very intimate. Almost like, in fact, more than the kind of love that husband and wife share. Okay? That is the kind of figure or image that is used to describe also the love of the Holy Trinity within itself. Okay? The love of God the Father for God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. The kind of love that, that uh, permeates, so to speak, the Holy Trinity uh, is something like the love of marriage. Okay? So that's how uh, you know we cannot we cannot quite comprehend the love of God, right? But that is the closest, perhaps the closest description and image that we could uh, we could have about the kind of intimacy that that God's love um, has, okay? And also God's love for mankind. So, so in the context of this particular um, gospel. When Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom, okay, because that's what he's saying, can, can, uh, can uh, the guests, in this sense, the guests are his apostles, can people who are celebrating a marriage actually mourn? Aren't they supposed to be happy? Right? You, we have been to several weddings, and, uh, and you would notice that you know, people are normally happy. They're joyous. They're celebrating the uh, union and the love of, uh, of a couple, right? the newly wedded couple. So there's plenty of celebration, jubilation you know, uh, around. Now, you cannot, that nobody mourns, nobody is sad when, when uh, you're celebrating a, a marriage, right? a wedding feast. So, so, Jesus, when he says, can the, bride, can the guests uh, mourn when the bridegroom is with them? He is referring to himself as being the bridegroom there. Right? And when he does that, he is actually asserting, asserting his divinity. He is actually confirming to these uh, inquisitors of his, those who are questioning him, He's actually affirming before them that, hey, I am the bridegroom that all of the prophets have talked to you about. I am that bridegroom. And because I am the bridegroom, right, in, in a wedding ceremony, which in the Jewish context, by the way, was celebrated lengthily for several days. It was a prolonged feast. Okay? A wedding celebration was prolonged as far as the Jewish uh, culture and tradition was concerned. So Jesus was talking about, uh, was putting into context something that they were familiar with, right? Uh, a marriage feast is a prolonged celebration. So while the bridegroom is with them celebrating, well, nobody mourns. Nobody fasts. Nobody uh, puts on a long face. Everybody's happy. While the bridegroom is with them, there's plenty of wine and jubilation and food, right? Remember the wedding feast at Cana? See, they, Our Lady was worried, there's no more wine now. We're not going to celebrate. The, we, we need to celebrate more. So she asked Jesus, hey, Jesus, there's no more wine. You better do something and help this couple so that we can continue celebrating their love, right? So weddings are a big thing for the Jews. So they understood that. Oh, yeah, that's right. While the bridegroom is there, right? We cannot, there's no such thing as, as fasting or mourning. It's all about celebrating. It's all about celebrating. So Jesus was saying, well, I am still here. I am here. I am the bridegroom. So nobody mourns or fasts. Because you have me in your midst. You have me in your midst. Right? So, that is, on the one hand, on the one hand, that is the message Jesus talks about here. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. It is not against fasting. Okay? It is not against fasting. Some people think that uh, 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 Jesus was against fasting. No, not quite. But he 
in this particular segment of the gospel, what he wanted to do was to assert his divinity, that he is actually the God who loved his people, the bridegroom in the Old Testament who loved his people. Now he is here. Now this is the bridegroom. I am the bridegroom now. Okay? And I'm showing you my love. Okay? And that is why we do not fast while we have the bridegroom. Okay, but now speaking of fasting, okay, since it's the time of Lent, we will comment on fasting. And our Lord said here, when the days of the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast. Then they will fast. Why is that? Why is fasting, why has fasting always been an important component in the spiritual life of not only Catholics, but the Jews and the, the chosen people and, and actually many other cultures. Okay? Why is fasting a, a, uh, uh, um, a, uh, a spiritual exercise that has always been part of, uh, of uh, the practice of faith? Okay? Why? Because what is fasting? What do you do when you fast? Okay, <laughs> you eat one complete meal. Yeah, well, that is our application of it now, right? But in general, what does fasting mean? What is the, what is meant by fasting? What do you do when you fast? Okay, you give up or you deprive yourself of food. As simple as that, right? You deprive yourself of nourishment, of food for a time. Right? You, you, you sacrifice the, the, uh, the partaking of some form of nourishment. That's what fasting is all about. Right? You understand that? What is the effect of that in the body? The effect is, uh, and on a person, the effect is there is some sort of craving. Right? You long to be nourished. You long to be filled because you, you, you feel the emptiness inside of you, right? There is a very real hunger. You feel the pangs of hunger within you when, when you are not filled with food, when you don't have nourishment, right? You grow hungry, right? You, and, and you crave for that which nourishes you. You crave for that which fills you. Now let's put that in the spiritual context. When you actually fast, okay, physically, when you fast physically, okay, it is a good reminder, good reminder of what you crave for spiritually, of what you can crave for spiritually. It is a good reminder that our souls are also deprived, okay? that, that many times, many times because of sin, we deprive our souls of the grace of God, which is our, the nourishment of our soul, which is our spiritual food, which is our spiritual nourishment. Okay? Now, since, since man is composed of body and soul, okay, we are not angels, we have bodies, to deprive our bodies voluntarily by fasting, is a very good reminder of the deprivation that we sometimes cause our own soul because of our own sins. And when we deprive ourselves of food voluntarily and remind ourselves about the deprivation of our soul, then we create a craving. We create a craving for God. We create a craving for grace. And they're, 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 it builds up a longing, a longing to receive that grace and to fill our souls with grace, with God's grace. To fill our soul with the love that our souls require in order for it to be healthy, okay? in order to be, for it to be united with God. And that is why fasting is always a recommendable uh, exercise uh, uh, of faith, especially this time of Lent. See? 
And at the same time, that the, the the hunger we feel and the the difficulty of of uh, of uh, and the challenge of uh, of going through the day hungry, is also a very good mortification that we can unite to the sufferings of Christ on Calvary. Okay? So these are the two prong um, uh, benefits of fasting. It does not only remind us of the deprivation of our souls from the from the absence of grace in it and it makes us crave for God more but at the same time the physical difficulty of hunger because of the fast is a good way a good sacrifice to offer up to Jesus to unite those uh, hunger pangs and sacrifices to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and that way we become like uh, uh, partners of Jesus in bringing about his mission of redemption. Okay? We become like co-redemptors, so to speak, right? in, in our own little way. We contribute and we unite our own sacrifice to that of Jesus. And that way, our physical sacrifices don't just become just another hardship okay they acquire a spiritual meaning they acquire a supernatural meaning and that is when they become tolerable that is when they become a joy to go through that is when human suffering becomes a, a, a source of joy a source of peace and a source of union with God. Okay? You know, some people could not understand. Wow, you're already suffering. You're in pain. You're suffering. You went through these difficulties. How can you smile? Do you realize only Catholics can do that? Only people who understand the value of sacrifice can actually put on a smile despite their difficulties in life despite their hardships, despite their pains, whether it be physical, psychological, emotional, or otherwise, or when they're sick. Only good Catholics who understand the value of sacrifice can put on a smile despite their difficulties. The virtue of cheerfulness okay, is, can only be exhibited, really, by people who understand the value of sacrifice. Okay? Uh, and so and, and this is the value of sacrifice when we unite it to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, well, we went over time already. Well, we have to go and uh, go to mass. So, folks, that's it for us. Oh, hi, Grandpa Jacob is there listening to us today. He just popped up there. Say hi to Grandpa. You want to say hi to Grandpa? Hi, Grandpa. <laughs> Yeah, we are beginning to uh, get a little sick today, it seems. So anyway, it's the weekend. So happy weekend, everybody. Oh, and happy uh, Chinese New Year. Uh, it's Chinese New Year already. Uh, we, we Happy Chinese New Year. And we, we uh, want to give a special shout out to our Chinese friends, particularly the... Boyd! <laughs> the Boyd family. Hello, Boyds. Uh, hey there. They might already be in Shanghai by now uh, because they wanted to celebrate Chinese New Year back in Shanghai. So if you can hear us, if you can watch this broadcast, well, we wish you all a very happy Chinese New Year. And to all our other Chinese friends, happy uh, Chinese New Year. Hey, I couldn't hey, quite... Hey. Ho Tua Cho Wa Wai. I couldn't quite say the Chinese green. <laughs> but anyway, okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Hey, hey. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.